Um, thank you, Fiek, and it's a real pleasure to be here to respond to this book. Uh, but I'll warn you now, this isn't going to be pretty. Over 500 pages, 186 extracts, a surge of words from some of the finest writers this island has ever produced, and I'm going to smash them all into about 20 minutes. The three extracts you're going to hear come to you absolutely at the peril of my judgment, from that slightly disgruntled sense that I might have picked differently or better, that I could have picked many other trios for very different purposes for very different ends. In any three extracts, you miss the richness of this book, the depth of it, the bellow of it, the clamour of excitement and enthusiasm so many of the authors captured inside its covers had for their schemes and their certainties and their ideas for their own times. Taking just three of them is a bit like taking an animal out of its nature, not seeing what it hunts, what it feeds on, what it fears. This book challenges you to read on, read more, read beyond it. Um, sorry. <laughs> to find again or anew some of the familiar voices, to listen to them differently, because you're hearing them here amid some of the sound and fury that prompted them, much of it signifying something, some of it inevitably nothing. I'm keen you don't miss out on the din of it all, the fervor of a time that roars out of its pages. It's full of peoples and groups and organizations giddy with the possibility of their own commotion, angry and eager for, and keen for something to start, for things to begin. We sense it from the students gripping their O'Grownies, described for us in the book by Louis-Paul Dubois as following with their lips the soft speech of their teachers. We find it in their hunger for the words they don't yet know how to say. We hear it in the poem school made us learn off by heart, maybe more in the ones it never taught us of at all. We find it far beyond the well-known names, beyond the ways we've chosen to study them among their obvious enemies and friends. We find it in places we might never have thought the revival could reach. Arise, botanic Celts, and glut your ire, cries the botanist Emily Lawless in 1899. It seems nothing was beyond it, not even the plants and the trees. This book gives, us the, revival, gives the revival its rhythms and its sounds. We can hum along with Percy French, even if we aren't quite sure how we came to know the tune. We can experience the revival even with a texture and a taste. For Douglas Hyde, the feel of it was wool and worsted. Only when Irishmen freed themselves, as he put it, of English second-hand trousers, generally dirty in front and hanging in muddy tatters at the heels, would they de-anglicise Ireland to some purpose. If clothes make it the man, then why not the nation? Hyde's freeze, freeze breeches might have served us better than the parade of hair shirts and mohair suits, of charvet shirts, and I suppose now hair shirts once again. Its taste, well, with so many sweet shops looted, the Easter Rising tasted, James Stevens tells us, of sweet stuffs, many never toothed before. But cheek by jowl with the sweet savour, as he calls it, he gives us the blood of a horse's throat cut. It takes Stevens the breath of a single sentence to sour any sweet, easy sweet taste of 1916. And just so, we struggle with the rising still. In a book of far more sights and images and sounds, I settled on some of the more disputatious sorts. It might speak more to my own nature, but I think it makes a wider point about the kind of revival this book allows you to find. So I want to start with fury rather than sound. So here comes Sing. Can we go back into our mother's womb? A letter to the Gaelic League by a hedge schoolmaster, 1907. Much of the writing that has appeared recently in the papers takes it for granted that Irish is gaining the day in Ireland and that this country will soon speak Gaelic. No supposition is more false. The Gaelic League was founded on a doctrine that is made up of ignorance, fraud and hypocrisy. Irish as a living language is dying out year by year. The day the last old man or woman who can speak Irish only dies in Connacht or Munster, a day that is coming near, will mark a station in the Irish decline which will be final a few years later. As long as these old people who speak Irish only are in the cabins, the children speak Irish to them. A child will learn as many languages as it has need of in its daily life. But when they die, the supreme good sense of childhood will not cumber itself with two languages when one is enough. It will play, quarrel, say its prayers and make jokes of good and evil, make love when it's old enough, write if it has wit enough, in this language, 
which is its mother tongue. The result is what could be expected beforehand, and it is what is taking place in Ireland in every Irish-speaking district. I believe in Ireland. I believe the nation that has made a place in history by 17 centuries of manhood, a nation that has begotten Grattan and Emmett and Parnell, will not be brought to complete insanity in these days by what is senile and slobbering in the doctrine of the Gaelic League. There was never till this time a movement in Ireland that was gushing, cowardly and maudlin, and yet now we are passing England in the hysteria of old women's talk. A hundred years ago, Irishmen could face a dark existence in Kilmainham jail or lurch on the halter before a grinning mob, but now they fear any gleam of truth. How are the mighty fallen? Was there ever a sight so piteous as an old and respectable people setting up the ideals of Fiji because, with their eyes glued on John Bull's navel, they dare not be Europeans for fear the huckster across the street might call them English. This delirium will not last always. It will not be long, we will make it our first hope, till some young man with blood in his veins, logic in his wits and courage in his heart will sweep over the backside of the world to the uttermost limbo this credo of mouthing gibberish. I speak here not of the old and magnificent language of our manuscripts or of the two or three dialects still spoken though with many barbarisms in the west and south, but of the incoherent twaddle that is passed off as Irish by the Gaelic League. This young man will teach Ireland again that she is part of Europe and teach Irishmen that they have wits to think, imaginations to work miracles, and souls to possess insanity. He will teach them that there is more in heaven and earth than the weekly bellow of the brazen bull calf and all his sweaty gobs, or the sniveling booklets that are going through Ireland like the scab on sheep. And yet, he'll give the pity that is due to the poor stammerers that mean so well, though they are stripping the nakedness of Ireland in the face of her own sons. Slobbering, gushing, cowardly, snivelling, maudlin, huckster, gibberish, twaddle, we don't really need the sweaty gobs of the brain bull calf to sense that Singh is not a happy man. The objections of some in the Gaelic League to the Playboy of the Western World prompted these words, this letter in 1907, but I don't want to rehearse again the particulars of it here. It is the anger in it that I want to put to some wider use. Historians are quite blunt creatures, so I'll wield a hammer to crack a nut. There are a lot of people in this book who just don't get along, and perhaps our culture is all the richer for it. The controversy over the Playboy, while probably the most well-known or most public expression of the divisions within the revival, is here just to labor the point that it was by no means the only one, that division and rancor might well have been at the heart of what made the revival tick. I'm minded of Orson Welles' Harry Lyme, the third man stepping off the Ferris wheel in Vienna, praising the virtues of war, and while quite inappropriate here in many respects, he captures something of what I mean. Remember what the fella said? In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> in 1947, when she looked back at the revival, Mary Cullum wrote of the many clubs and societies and individuals, some, she says, at war with each other, but all exciting and somehow focused towards one end, a renaissance. That she could meet, as she said, between Abbey Street and College Green in a five-minute walk, every person of importance in the life of the city at a certain time in the afternoon, adds to a sense of one place, one purpose, and even despite those wars amongst themselves, maybe one straightforward end. I want Singh here to undermine the convenience of hindsight, the hindsight that might bundle a period or a set of people together under an easy title without admitting that it was all elbows and sharp tongues and bruised pride. Yeats writes in here that Standish O'Grady could find quarrel in a straw. And after reading all of these extracts, I have to say it is a talent not unique to O'Grady after all. In case the definite article of the book's title, the the of the revival, comes to fool you, sing as a reminder not to be. 
There are revivals, plural, inside the book's covers, and the variety of the extracts presented lets us see them, almost as if we could see the chaos of atoms hurtling around and towards each other, being shaped and made new by all the collision there. Don't open its covers expecting a coherence of voice. You've come to eavesdrop on a row, and the chairs are just about to get thrown. Like you will find in any row, there's a lot of certainty here. There is the awful arrogance of absolute conviction, the knowing what is best, not just for themselves, but for everyone else as well. A 19-year-old, Patrick Pierce, writing in a letter to Aunt Clive Sullish in May 1899, long before the playboy was even at lint in Singh's eye, marked out a contrary territory to sing. In a tirade against the notion of an Irish literary theatre, Pierce said, it is time for him to be, uh, sorry, um, he reduced Yeats to a mere English poet of the third or fourth rank. As such, Pierce called him harmless. But when this third rater had the temerity, as Pierce put it, to run an Irish literary theatre, Pierce said, it's time for him to be crushed. An Irish literature in English was to Pierce in 1899 at least, an unnatural beast of a thing. It was to be put from his sight, let us strangle it at its birth. For the socialist Frederick Ryan, the Irish language was simply a distraction, turning minds from what mattered. What he called the gigaw of a new grammar was just not enough. There was something of pathos in it, he wrote, when young men and young women rushed to acquire the rudiments of Irish, just to show that they are not as other nations are, that there was nothing else to set them apart. As the arguments and ideas go on and on in this book, Fluther Good seems to come out over the roar of it all, more loudly still as his explicit stage direction goes. There's no necessity to be raising your voice, shouting's no manifesting forth of a growing mind. Plenty of people in this book seem to be ever so sure of how growing minds should grow, regardless of what those growing minds might want. Hyde, D.P. Moran, Singh, himself in the very first extract of this book bemoans the modern taste for tawdry things, that Juvenal and Perseus and Cicero were now nowhere read, that even among the landlord class, Longfellow and Hall Crane and Maria Corelli were the only books to be found in the hands of those he felt were once the arbiters of taste. We must set our face sternly against penny dreadfuls, shilling shockers and still more the garbage of vulgar English weeklies like the Bow Bells and the Police Intelligence, Hyde wrote. Every house, he said, should have a copy of Moore and Davis so that this island will ever remain Celtic at the core. More and chided the literary types with what he termed the little stir they caused in minor literary circles in London, but that the Irish demand for the Police Gazette had not been dampened at all by their designs. George Russell describes as follows, districts in Ireland as uninfluenced by books as if they were in the centre of the Sahara. He felt, as he said, the farmers of Ireland should have a culture suited to their class, but never stopped to ask why he was the one who got to say what suits why he got to distinguish between sand and soil. There are many farmers and peasants, many notional versions of what the Irish people might and could and should be in this book. The language they should and shouldn't speak, the books they should and shouldn't read, the music they should hear, the songs they should sing, even the trousers they should wear, are thrust upon them as if they didn't have the sense themselves to choose. It is in the face of all of this presumption that I call James Joyce to hand. James Joyce from A Port Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 1916. He pushed open the latchless door of the porch and passed through the naked hallway into the kitchen. A group of his brothers and sisters were sitting round the table. Tea was nearly over and only the last of the second watered tea remained in the bottoms of the small glass jars and jam pots which did service for teacups. Discarded crusts and lumps of sugared bread, turned brown by the tea which had been poured over them, lay scattered on the table. Little wells of tea lay here and there on the board, and a knife with a broken ivory handle was stuck through the pith of a ravaged turnover. The sad, quiet, grey-blue glow of the dying day came through the window and the open door, covering over and allaying quietly a sudden instinct of remorse in Stephen's heart. All that had been denied them had been freely given to him, 
the eldest. But the quiet glow of evening showed him in their faces no sign of rancor. He sat near them at the table and asked where his father and mother were. One answered, Gone borrow, to borrow, look borrow, at borrow, at borrow, house borrow. Still another removal. A boy named Fallon in Belvedere had often asked him, with a silly laugh, why they moved so often. A frown of scorn darkened quietly his forehead as he heard again the silly laugh of the questioner. He asked, why are we on the move again, if it's a fair question? Because borrow, the borrow, land borrow, lord borrow, will borrow, put borrow, us borrow, out borrow. The voice of his youngest brother, from the farther side of the fireplace, began to sing the air, oft in the stilly night. One by one, the others took up the air, until a full choir of voices was singing. They would sing so for hours, melody after melody, glee after glee, till the last pale light died down on the horizon, till the first dark night clouds came forth and night fell. He waited for some moments, listening, before he too took up the air with them. He was listening with pain of spirit to the overtone of weariness behind their frail, fresh, innocent voices. Even before they set out on life's journey, they seemed weary already of the way. When Singh hoped for some young man with blood in his veins, logic in his wits, and courage in his heart, Joyce, well, this Joyce, may not have been what he expected. With that weary already of the way, there is certainly more in heaven and earth than the weekly bellow of the brazen bull calf. In that sense, Singh maybe got what he wanted. But playboy or protesters, stammerers of Irish or mumblers of English, weary already of the way, leaves them all just a little like dancing angels on the head of a pin. Joyce isn't here just to make some laboured point about the, the elite nature of the revival, although there is, in some of the extracts, more than a little of the quaint peasant being admired by their betters for their inveterate nobility and simplicity. At its most extreme in this book, Roger Casement distinguishes between what he calls the savage and the civilised man. The savage is, he says, while the white man has. The savage has the happier and the purer life something easier to say at civilizations, com comfortable remove. Even Casement's self-conscious use of inverted commas doesn't absolve him of that. Joyce snaps out of this book, biting back at all the imagined futures the authors propose, demanding something to be done with the stinking disappointment of the here and now, with the stinking disappointment that the worst wrongs are ones we've perpetrated on ourselves. That we haven't the courage or the wit to change them, he brings heartbreakingly home with oft in the stilly night, with those frail, fresh, innocent voices being given such a song to sing. Their youth of discarded crusts of second-watered tea is so at odds with the fond youth past that the song laments. A broken, ivory-handled knife was a poor remnant of a life better than this. At some point in this book, Yeats celebrates the notion of the common people, as he terms them, guarding something learning civility and gentility has lost. That, as he writes, the common people Wherever civilization has not driven its plough too deep, keep a watch over the roots of all religion and romance. Pushing through that latchless door with Stephen Dedalus, on through the naked hallway, this was a cold house for religion and romance indeed. James Connolly put it plainly thus, you cannot teach starving men Gaelic to the majority of our workers and most, our, the most priceless manuscript of ancient Celtic lore would hold but a secondary place in their esteem beside a rasher of bacon. The certainty of poverty is everywhere in this book, and it defies the many certainties of those who claim, also in its pages, that they can cure it. The Irish Homestead, the journal of the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society, initiated a competition, the book tells us, in 1901. A prize of £25 would be awarded to the cooperative society that would make their parish a place where no Irishman would like to emigrate from. While the journal's indifference to the fate of Irish women is revealing, its suggestions 
as to what might amount to what it termed social amelioration are almost more telling still. National sports, Gaelic pastimes, classes for Gaelic Irish literature and poetry, reviving Cayleys, encouraging music and village choirs, having dancing, jigs and recitations, launching a crusade against badly kept and dirty homes. These things it proposed would make men stay. Perhaps it is the hopefulness of even this, the conviction in it, the optimism of this and so many of the extracts here that believed in all sorts of better Irish futures, that we are drawn to this period in the way that we often are, that we romanticise the revival because it is still a time of what might have been rather than the experience of independence that was. I was surprised that the Mountains of Morn was in here. Growing up in the 1980s, I heard it first in a context far from the revival, far from the poems of Yeats and the plays of Singh I learned at school. O oh Mary, this London's a wonderful sight with people all working by day and by night, all working. All is the word in 1986, just as it was when Percy French wrote it in 1896, just as it was in the 1920s, even in the depression of the 1930s, even through the bombs of the 40s and more so in the gloom of the 50s. O oh Mary, this London's still a wonderful sight. Only now, so too is Sydney and Vancouver and Dubai. Did we let the revival down, as this book seems to suggest? No, I'm with Joyce. We let ourselves down, most of all. I want to end, as the book does, with George Bernard Shaw. There's a lot to be said for a cantankerous end. George Bernard Shaw from the Irish State Statesman, 1928. Ireland is now in a position of special and extreme peril. Until the other day, we enjoyed a factitious prestige as a thorn in the side of England, or shall I say, from the military point of view, the Achilles heel of England. When we were given a free hand to make good, we found ourselves out with a shock that has taken all the moral pluck out of it as completely as shell shock. We can recover our nerve only by forcing ourselves to face new ideas, proving all things and standing by that which is good. The moral is obvious. In the 19th century, all the world was concerned about Ireland. In the 20th, nobody outside Ireland cares twopence what happens to her. If she, holds on, if she holds her own in front of European culture, so much the better for her and Europe. But if, having broken England's grip of her, she slips back into the Atlantic as a little grass patch in which a few million moral cowards cannot call their souls their own, then the world will let these Irish go their own way into insignificance without the smallest concern. You can take that as censure or as challenge, maybe from our two editors as much as from George Bernard Shaw. If night follows day, then is a period defined as a revival naturally followed by a time of decline? Did the few million moral cowards seize the day? Did we make our way into insignificance with independence after all? Parts of Shaw's moral are obvious, as he says. We found ourselves out, as he put it. And without the 19th century struggle with Britain, he worried that the 20th did not seem to know what to do. Without Goliath, isn't David just a boy with a sling and a stone? The editors suggest that independent Ireland clung to the more tokenistic aspects of the revival, maybe went too easily the way of Shaw's few million moral cowards, maybe stayed too long, as Singh said at the start, with their eyes glued on John Bull's navel, without the courage, as Singh put it, to be Europeans for fear the huckster across the street might call them English. There's a lot of fretful popinjays lisping Irish wrongly, Sean O'Casey tells us here. Fight for Irish, no. Fight for collars and ties. In these mouths, Irish was just a way to a permanent and pensionable civil service job. Ernie O'Malley is called to arms in the book to expose the fetishization, it's hard to say, of the fight for independence. Even the living were quietly becoming folklore, he writes. I had heard my own name in song at the few dances I had attended. Many of us could hardly see ourselves for the legends built up around us. Unlike O'Malley, there were many who thought those legends were not something to resent. They did not mind that they could eclipse other definitions of what Irish meant. 
But part of me wants to rise to Shaw's challenge rather than dwell on his critique, to come out fighting for the few million moral cowards because no one really comes to their defence, or rather they assume to know what was best for them all. In the extract published here from The Road Round Ireland, Porrick Cullum's travelogue from the New Free State, published in 1926, he meets with the curate, the young doctor, the newspaper editor of an unnamed town. Despite the upset of the years just gone, they all seemed sure, as the curate puts it, that the old restraints would once again be observed. It's an easy half sentence, too easy almost, to sum up an uncomplicated sense of an independent Ireland, dosed high on obedience, subservience and morality, but without much of Shaw's moral pluck. Cullum went on to criticise the nature of the society he found. Such social well-being as there is here, he writes, is only grudgingly shared. No attempt is being made to add to it or to give what there is of it, any original or distinctive cast. There is no park here, there is no public music, there is no library, no collection of pictures. The education to be got here is only elementary, and there is no one here who would strive to make it wider, deeper, or more interesting. But in a way, why are we drawn so readily to interpretations of independence such as this? Of course, the realities of independence were always going to let the expectations down. We were by no means the only new state in post-war Europe to learn the hard way of that. Unlike many of the others, though, we did survive. We had probably some of the most stable 1920s and 30s in Europe, and we avoided the excesses of political extremes when much of Europe began to march to the rhythms of a fascist or a communist jackboot. What we might now see as post-independence, post-revival stasis or disappointment maybe only seems so when you look back at us through the 1950s, the 1980s, maybe back through the disappointments of now. What independence might have been or could have been or should have been is, a, is more a mantra of our own discontents, our own sense that at some point it all went wrong and not fixing it was someone else's fault. It's the blunt historian in me again, but it was what it was. The moral cowards, as we might call them, made their own choices, took their own risks, cho chose which opportunities they wanted to escape as well as miss. Some upstart will stand here or somewhere like it in a hundred years' time and will have real fun with the mess we are now and have been in. E.P. Thompson called it the enormous condescension of posterity. And by God, posterity will condescend to us in turn. The editors challenge us to be inspired by the hope and ambition of the extracts to imagine our own futures. The few million moral cowards on that little green grass patch who may well have been slipping back into the Atlantic by our own lights. They imagined their futures with the same excitement and exhilaration as Singh or Yeats, as here and now. What they did, what they imagined, what they tried and achieved and failed may not suit us nor sit well with us, but they are still the mess and the stuff of us all the same. We have D.P. Moran in us as much as we have John Millington Singh. It's obvious I'm not a literary scholar. I work with the words of what some of the authors in this book might well call the strivers and the strugglers, the militarists and bureaucrats of independence, which this book is, in the end, quite critical of. And for all the revival's eloquence, I think I have a sympathy for my strivers and my strugglers still. I've enjoyed my excursion, and I'll come back and look at my familiar striving faces in slightly different ways, but that's where I belong. Given where we are, Yeats can end this far better than me. I end my lecture, he said, in the middle, or even perhaps at the beginning of the story. So do as he says, go and read on and finish it for yourselves. <laughs>